hobby. And I'm just uh, getting this up on YouTube right now. And we'll get started. All right, well, great. And thank you everybody for, for joining us. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and stop sharing my screen and uh, hand it over to Bobby. But again, any questions you have, please let me know and, and I will go ahead and ask them of Bobby. Thanks so much. <laughs> Sorry for the delay, folks. Uh, having technical problems, I had to reset my router about five times. Oh no. <laughs> I don't know, the, you know, the weather maybe, our, our internet is tenuous sometimes, but uh, welcome uh, to everyone who's watching. Uh, we've been using Stellarium, and if you don't know how to get that software, it's available completely for free for practically any kind of computer, Windows, Mac, or Linux. Uh, it's at stellarium.org, and I'm going to show you how the sky looks right now. Of course, our grass is not that green, and our leaves have not come out. That's just an optional setting in, in Stellarium, but we can look around and make the sun set. And down here shows you the clock and the controls, but you can also uh, use the keys like J, K, and L. L is forward. So if you hit it a couple of times, you start to see the, the sun moving. And I'm going to hit it more to advance it to tonight's sunset. And tonight's sunset's not going to be until about 7.34. It's going to be cold tonight, <laughs> maybe a little clear. We might get some clouds coming in. So you might have a good chance of seeing this if you bundle up. If I hit J, I can make the time slow down. And there you see the sunset around 7.30. And yes, we've been talking about it for the last couple of sessions, but there's planet Venus. The first light you'll see as soon as it gets a little dark. But I wanted to focus on some of the things on the other side of the sky that are less seasonal in nature. So I'm gonna take the highlight off of Venus and just let you folks enjoy what else is visible. You may remember from other sessions that we saw Venus crossing in front of the Pleiades just a week ago or so. And now there's quite a bit of distance. Here's the constellation Orion and his big dog and his little dog. And high above them, the two twins, Gemini. So hopefully you remember some of our previous lessons. And at the same time, rising over in the east, we have the great goddess Virgo, the constellation of Virgo, and we talked a lot about her, and we've got in between Virgo and the Gemini twins, we've got Leo the lion. So hopefully you'll remember some of the things we've talked about, a little bit of a review, but this is what's gonna be in the sky tonight. But Virgo, Leo, Cancer, Gemini, Taurus, Orion, those are all constellations that are in a part of the sky that is very seasonal just like the story of Virgo and Persephone appearing in the spring and disappearing in the fall. So this part of the sky does not give you a constant set of constellations that you can see every night of the year. But if you turn around and look toward the north, we have a different story here. So if you look towards the north, which I'll just point out, Venus now is on that side of the sky because the view of Stellarium is pretty wide. So we'll get like a fisheye lens kind of view. So if that's Venus over here, when you're looking north, Venus will be on your left. But I want you to look for something that I hope everybody recognizes because it's one of the things in the sky that's visible every single night of every year here in the Northeast Kingdom and anywhere in the Northern Latitude. I'm talking about the seven stars of the Big Dipper. Seven stars, four that make a scoop right here, and three that make a handle, like the handle on the ladle that you might use to get the stew out of the stew pot on the stove at supper time. So imagine that as a big ladle, and this is always visible to us, and I'm going to put up a, a, a picture that's going to show you why. If you go into the sky and viewing options window, you can go to the marking section, which has a huge uh, menu of things that you can highlight. And the one I wanna show you is circumpolar circles. Circumpolar means close to going around Polaris. And Polaris is the famous North Star. And look at how perfectly centered in that circle Polaris is. But for our perspective, I want you to notice that 
the Big Dipper is inside of that circumpolar circle. And for me and other, you know, nighttime observers, this circumpolar circle really means the stuff that you can see any night of the year. All of the stars inside of that are going to be visible regardless of the season. And so uh, this is a great part of the sky to learn because it doesn't matter what season it is. And also the North Star and knowledge of that could possibly save your life. So how are you gonna find it? Well, the Big Dipper is definitely the easiest thing in the circumpolar circle to find. And if you use the two stars that you would be slurping your soup from, those two stars draw an imaginary line right towards the North Star. So remember that this line is constant no matter where that Big Dipper is. And uh, just for fun, I'm gonna play around with time just to show you how that Big Dipper will point towards the North Star, but you gotta remember that the angle of the Big Dipper is gonna be changing throughout the seasons. So if you hit the date and time window here on Stellarium, you can advance through the months. Notice that it's 850 in our time. So if I go to the next couple of months, you're gonna notice that 850 is not even gonna be dark yet, but look at, pay particular close attention to where the Big Dipper will be in May at this time. Wow, look at that. In a month, it'll be that bright. 10 is born nine o'clock. So let's advance the clock just a little more so that we can get it fully dark. All right, so now we have to wait till 10 o'clock to see the Big Dipper easily. Let's jump into June. Oh. All right, now do you see it's going downward on the left side of that circle? July, August, September, October. So just pay close attention to the fact that those two pointer stars, even in October when it's on the opposite side of where it is now, those two stars will be pointing right at Polaris. So this is a group of stars that could literally save your life. And if I go through November and December and January, February and March and back to April, you see that in a kind of elegant way, the Big Dipper is an annual clock that rotates around the North Star. So there's a lot of cool things about this that you can use. There's even a great story from the Abenaki Nation that incorporates the stars that we know as the Big Dipper into a different story that talks about it walking around this circle, taking a whole year. Well, now I'm actually going to just jump us a whole year back because this is 2021. Did you notice, by the way, in 2021, Venus will also be visible. Nice kind of connection there. But all right, it's late. It's after 10 o'clock. And now we're seeing what that part of the sky looks like tonight. So I'm going to take that circumpolar circle out, talk a little bit more about the Big Dipper, because that's not even its official name. And I hope I hear some questions from you folks, if you have any. Let me know if there's uh, any particular thing you want to add to this. Maybe some of you have heard other names for the Big Dipper because it is a very famous thing in the sky. And oh, this is when I have to teach you an unfortunate term in astronomy that might uh, make people's eyes glaze over. But the Big Dipper is not a constellation. Technically, it's what we call an asterism. And an asterism is any folk picture or any even imaginary picture that you make up for your own self and your own family with the stars. So the Big Dipper is a very easily recognized asterism, but it belongs to a particular constellation that the International Astronomical Union has designated. This is not up for debate anymore, but it's in Ursa Major. So Ursa Major is the constellation that the Big Dipper belongs to. Technically speaking, if we wanna get our words all straight, the Big Dipper is an asterism within the constellation of Ursa Major. So I'm gonna stop with those terms now because I want you to know Ursa Major is Latin for the Big Bear. And in the case of Stellarium's artwork, sometimes I don't like the way the pictures conform to the stars, but in this case, I think the artwork does a pretty good job of matching the way I kind of see the bear. Now, the first thing you will notice is that the Big Dipper is only a small part of the bear. And what is up with that tail? That I'll try to explain, but maybe to make, make this easier on you viewers, I'm gonna try to orient things so that the bear is upright, which means I have to basically turn it upside down. This would be like standing in your backyard 
and then spinning your head around so that you were looking at it upside down so that it looked the way a bear would look right side up. This might be uncomfortable if you do it outside, but not a big deal in Stellarium. Let's see if I can, oh, just a little more. There. So the Big Dipper is the easy part to see, but if you add this star here, a star known as Muskida, that's the nose of the bear in my imagination. And here are the eyes of the bear and here are its ears. So here you have a formation of fairly visible, not super bright stars that make the head of the bear. And here's its chest and there's its front leg with its sharp claws on its front paw. So that chart part should be easy to add to the Big Dipper. If you can imagine that this is the belly of the bear, here's his little belly button. That's a star called Mirac, by the way. That is one of the pointer stars that points towards Polaris. And Polaris is just out of the frame right now, but that's the belly button of the bear. And opposite it is the back of the bear, a star called Duby. So imagine that that's the back, there's the belly button. And unfortunately for you, if you were using that little, I mean, that big dipper for eating stew, that scoop on the dipper is now the big bear's big butt. So you may not want that stew anymore. But this uh, you know, sort of trapezoid shape that makes the scoop of the Big Dipper is now the bear's hind quarters. And here's the bear's long hind leg. And there are the stars that I like to see as the toes on its big flat-footed bear paw. So if that's the bear's hind leg, and here is its rear end, here is its head, here's its front leg, and here we have the belly. I think you can see why that looks like a bear, or really any quadruped you can imagine. It could be made into that. But what is up with the three stars? Well, that's where we have some fun. Because those of you who are fans of Greek mythology may know that there's a story that uh, says that this bear was once a woman named Callisto, who was a queen, a beautiful brunette. And uh, she had the misfortune of getting the attention of Zeus. It wasn't her fault, but Zeus had a weakness for mortal women. And he was always trying to... Uh, you know, start romantic affairs with them, to put it mildly. So in this case, Zeus tried to kiss the queen, but Zeus's wife, Hera, saw what he was up to. And in revenge, he turned that queen into a bear right when they're in the middle of their smooch. So all of a sudden, Zeus realized he had been busted. His, uh, the woman in front of him was no longer there, but instead a big brown bear was there. And it was, it's all part of a very funny story, but I'm not going to go into all the details of this ancient Greek myth, but let me just say that a weird part of the story is that when this bear expired, Zeus placed her in the sky by grabbing her little short, teeny tiny, stumpy, little normal looking knob like bear tail and swinging it around his head. And he swung it and swung it and swung it and swung it so far and so fast that poof, when he let it go, that bear flew into the sky and got stuck amongst the stars forever. But unfortunately for Callisto, by the time Zeus let go of that little short stubby bear tail, it got totally stretched out. And that is probably the best known story about Ursa Major that we get from the ancient Greek myths. But this is by no means the only story about these stars. In fact, it's not even the only story about a bear in these stars because the first Vermonters, the first people to live on this land, the Abenaki people, have a story about a bear in the sky called Kitsi Owasos. And Kitsi Owasos in the Abenaki language means the big bear. So it's practically the same exact uh, name as Ursa Major in Latin. But in the Abenaki stories, these three stars are not a long tail, but three hunters. The first hunter, a star known by its Arabic name, Alio, but in the Abenaki stories, this is a hunter that's going to catch the bear. The second hunter behind is getting ready to cook some stew. So he's got a campfire burning. He's got his pot of water boiling. And he's hoping the first hunter is going to bring home some meat so they can all eat. And this third hunter, well, he's lazy. He doesn't want to help his buddies hunt the bear or cook the food or even get firewood. He just wants to show up at camp just in time to eat that delicious stew. So there's a funny story about these three hunters. It's well known to other American Indian nations, not just the Abenaki folks, but many folks uh, native to Eastern Canada and up and down the East Coast of the United States have a story about this bear and the three hunters that chase him. 
But here's my favorite part about the story. And this is something that can help you use the Big Dipper in another way. Let's see if I can zoom in a little closer to that tail there and show you that if you can't see it yet, that second hunter, the one that's supposed to be cooking on a campfire, well, there's actually two stars there. Mizar is the bright star that's easy to see. It's part of the handle of the Big Dipper. But if you have 2020 vision, then you'll also see this little star called Alcor. And Alcor, from what I've read, means the rider, and Mizar means the horse in Arabic. So there's probably a funny story about that from the Arabic culture, but I haven't heard the story behind it. But I do know that in the Abenaki stories, this is the second hunter, and this is his campfire. And that is pretty cool to think about that because you have to have really sharp eyes to see it. And this has been used as a free eye exam, so to speak, in other cultures. In fact, according to legend, Genghis Khan, the famous Mongolian emperor, he had an elite cavalry of archers that were the best and he tested their eyes to see if they could see both Alcor and Mizar. Alcor is the dimmer one, the harder one to see. Mizar is the easy one. So if I zoom out in Solarium, you'll see how if you have anything but perfectly clear vision, you won't notice that there's two stars there. So for the Abenaki folks, it's re remembered as a little campfire next to a busy chef. So there's other ways and other stories that I could tell you about the Big Dipper, but I just want you to know of all the things in the sky, the Big Dipper is probably the most practically useful uh, asterism. It tells you which way north is by using these two stars to find Polaris. And it actually tests your vision with the stars Alcor and, and Mizar. So, I mean, what more can you ask from a constellation to have all of this going on for it in Ursa Major? And then one more thing to add to the list, this is the same asterism that is known as the drinking gourd. In fact, historians believe that the drinking gourd is what led to it being called the Big Dipper. Basically, they refer to the same tool, just one refers to the gourd that made it and the other one refers to how it's used. But have you ever seen a gourd? You can grow some in your garden. You might wanna start them now indoors so that they get a head start. And those little squashy vines that grow gourds, <coughs> pardon me, they have been used for thousands of years to make all kinds of containers. As imagine a birdhouse made out of a gourd or a maraca, if you've ever bought them on a Caribbean vacation. Or if you were a farmer or a slave, sadly working on a plantation, a gourd might have been your only drinking utensil. And so slaves from West Africa brought the idea that this is a gourd with them on the slave ships. And when slavery happened here in the United States, the drinking gourd took on a new meaning. You may have heard a song that says, follow the drinking gourd. For the old man is coming to carry you to freedom if you follow that drinking gourd. And many slaves did know this song. And just remembering those lyrics tells you that if you walk towards the drinking gourd, follow it, it will always lead you towards the north, which was the only places where a slave could hope to find their freedom during that terrible time in American history. And I recently enjoyed that movie Harriet about Harriet Tubman. They don't mention the drinking gourd specifically, but I do remember a very poignant scene where as soon as she makes her first escape from slavery, because she actually escaped many times with groups of people, but her first escape, the first thing she did after she ran out of the church where she was, was to stop and look up at the stars. And then she knew which way she was going. So perhaps they didn't have time to work the drinking gourd into the movie plot, but I do know that Harriet Tubman herself was familiar with the stars and I would love to know if she knew the Drinking Gourd song. That's something I haven't seen confirmed yet by historians. But what an amazing group of stars, the Big Dipper. Help you find your freedom during a time of slavery. Help you find the North during a normal time of life. Help you test your eyes. And it's part of the Big Bear, a bear constellation from the ancient Greeks and the Romans knew it a bear picture that the Abenaki folks knew. So it's another way to help you understand how the stars can connect the imaginations of people from very different cultures. They see similar patterns because no matter where we live, we all are humans and we all have similar imagination and we all have that same propensity to make pretty pictures with the light we see in the sky. So it's one of those cool things. If you 
spend your time learning the Big Dipper and everything about it, you can get in touch with all kinds of culture and folklore and music and history. So just think about how many other constellations are like that. And unfortunately, how many stories might be lost. That's my personal pet project is to collect as many stories as I can from all of the cultures of the world about all these stars. And hopefully one day we will have a richer, uh, a richer garden of stories to use in all of our uh, planetarium showings. So I think uh, that's about all my voice could probably put up with. You probably heard the frog in my voice. I'm sorry. I, I don't know if it's pollen or what not or jumping on the trampoline with my kids, but I seem to have lost my voice over the last day. So if you have any questions, I will happily answer those. However, you send them to us. Thank you all for watching. Yeah, thank you so much, Bobby, for your information and what we should look for. Uh, hopefully it won't be snowing. I just saw a snow flurry come by, but we'll hope for some clear weather tonight so folks can see what you've been talking about and all the connect those stories with the night sky. That would be awesome. And um, again, this program will be uh, next Tuesday at uh, 2.30 as well. So we'll have, this will be a continuing live program here with the Fairbanks Museum and Planetarium. Um, but thanks again. And again, any questions, uh, go ahead now. And if not, we'll, we're happy to take them by um, email or any other way that you guys want to get in touch with us, Facebook, all of that. Um, all right. Well, thanks again and have a great rest of your day. Take care, stay well, and uh, keep looking up. Yeah. <laughs>